Hi, and welcome to this seminar about TTIP and the geopolitical aspects of the Transatlantic Trade and Inv Investment Partnership. My name is Katarina Trach, and I'm the director of Stockholm Free World Forum, or Fribad, as we're called in Swedish. Uh, I just want to wish you all very welcome here, and with that, I will leave the word to my colleague, Erik Brattberg. Great. Thank you, Katarina, and welcome, welcome. Great to see all of you here, um, especially such a sunny day. I thought everyone would be at the beach. Um, so great to be here. This panel, like Katarina mentioned, is on TTIP and the bigger political and perhaps even geopolitical implications of TTIP. Um, and you might ask yourself, you know, why are we here at Försvarspolitiska Arena, where we normally talk about defense and security policy, like we saw in this video? Why are we here talking about trade? You know, what does this have to do with politics and, and defense and security and these broader geopolitical issues? Well, I think the answer is very simple. I think TTIP actually um, is, of course, about the economics, but it's also equally much about the political aspects. So that's really what we're going to delve into here at this panel, uh, to maybe go beyond some of the normal topics that we hear when we talk about TTIP. Um, oftentimes, the conversation, especially on this side of the Atlantic, tends to be about some of the more technical sometimes controversial aspects of TTIP, but I think this is an opportunity to really look at what is TTIP really about, um, how can it you know, strengthen Europe economically, how can it strengthen transatlantic relations, um, and how can it help position the West in a world that is increasingly becoming multi multipolar um, and where we're facing an increased amount of challenges. So we have a terrific panel with us. Uh, I couldn't think of two better people to address TTIP here in Sweden. Uh, we have Mike Lane from the U.S. Embassy, uh, who is the head of the Economic Units section. Uh, Michael has previously served in the U.S. Foreign Service with postings in Kab Kabul, Shanghai, Beijing, Ulaanbaatar, and Singapore, so quite a diverse background. Um, he has a B.A. from the University of Montana and an M.B.A. from Rutgers University, and he's a native of the great state of Montana. Um, and to my far right, we have Peter Dahlen, who is the Managing Director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Sweden. Uh, previously, he's worked extensively in the private sector and public sector in both the United States and in Sweden, including working for then Senator and currently Vice President Joe Biden. Um, and originally, I believe, from the state of Delaware, right. which of course was founded as a Swedish colony in the 1600s. So you're embodying the Swedish-American relations. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who will start making some introductory remarks, and then Peter will go from there, and then we'll bring in you, the audience, to talk about uh, the multipolar world and the implications of TTIP. Mike, please. All right. Well, let me first of all thank uh, Stockholm Free World Forum for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, this is my first time at Alma Dalen. Um, I have to say this is a remarkable experience. This is unlike anything that I've experienced. Um, it really is an amazing concept, an amazing event, and I would strongly recommend to Sweden that if it does do a free trade agreement with the United States, it includes the concept of Alma Dalen and exporting this concept <laughs> to the United States. I think we'd greatly benefit from that. Um, Eric asked me to say a few words on the broader geopolitical implications of TTIP from the U.S. perspective. Uh, but first I want to note one thing, and that is, it has been actually a remarkable week for U.S. trade policy. Even though it's really largely gone, gone unnoticed here in Sweden, in the Swedish press, uh, for those of you who are not aware, President Obama signed the Trade Promotion Authority um, on Monday after the Senate passed the legislation last week. Um, and for a while, it looked pretty tenuous that this legislation would actually get through Congress. Uh, for those of you who are not trade junkies and trying to explain what TPA is, it's actually um, it's colossal for U.S. trade policy to get this through. Um, we often refer to this as Fast Track Authority, or TPA, but what this essentially does is it, it paves the way for President Obama to sign trade deals, um, and it basically ties the hands of U.S. Congress, so U.S. Congress can only vote up or down on a trade agreement. Um, otherwise, you don't want to be negotiating with U.S. if you're negotiating with U.S. Congress. It would be like negotiating with 50 states, or akin to U.S. negotiating with the European Parliament. So this is really colossal. It really shows that the U.S. is dedicated to getting these free trade agreements that we have pending through. And I'll come back to this a bit in just a moment. Uh, but I wanted to note that because it is very important uh, for those who follow trade. Um, let me just say a few brief thoughts on the geopolitical implications of TTIP. Um, first, I've been here at Almodal in just a few days. 
and I've heard quite a bit of discussion about TTIP, and I really believe it's vitally important that we have really robust discussions on TTIP and try to make this the best agreement we can. I think that's, it's really important that we make this transparent, that we can talk about it, we can make this a really good agreement. And so I'm not against that, but what I've noticed is that um, some opponents of TTIP um, use myths, exaggeration, and fear to confuse the public on what it actually means. Um, but also, I think somewhere lost in that debate is that we forget what the fundamental reasons why we're focusing on TTIP, why we're looking at a translated trade agreement. And it goes back to what Eric said a bit earlier. Um, so I think it's really incumbent upon us to keep in mind the bigger political, geopolitical implications of what this means. Um, so first of all, I, we can't skip over any of this without talking about the economic opportunities that are there. Um, and this is perhaps the best opportunity we, we have in a generation to strengthen transatlantic ties. It really is. Um, and this was really interesting. I looked at the Washington Post and they had a really good blog uh, just a couple weeks ago. And it was interesting from my perspective is that it compared U.S. states, and if they produce GNP, if you measure GNP from a U.S. state perspective, and it took each of the states and compared them to an equivalent GNP around the world. And to illustrate this, it was interesting because Sweden was comparable to the state of Ohio. Just to give you a comparison, what the economies, equivalent economies would be. Um, New York, for example, was equivalent to the state effort, was equivalent to Spain, for example. And the, the California economy is somewhere equivalent to this, the country of Brazil. So this is by way of perspective and telling you how important this is from an economic perspective, both for the European Union and from the US. I mean, I want to emphasize this is a negotiation between equals, and I don't think the European Union has anything to, to fear when it's negotiating with the US. I think sometimes those fears are overblown when they, we talk about negotiating with the US. I don't think they're there. It is a, it is a um, negotiation between equals. But I mention this because we need to keep in mind the bigger economic aspect. Um, and what I also say is that, think about Sweden here. Uh, US as a single market, as a country market, we're already the fourth biggest export market. We're also the recipient of, we're, Sweden is the 11th biggest investor in the United States. But when it comes to defense, which I also find really interesting, because the last uh, discussion was just on um, defense material, but the US last year was your number one importer of defense material. I think that's really significant, and especially as Sweden begins to debate whether to export to non-democratic countries or not. I mean, think that here we are, the United States is your biggest recipient. And thinking about it in the bigger context, what if we can make that easier, and make it easier for Sweden to export its weapons material to the United States with a TTIP agreement? Again, it's a bigger picture issue, but I think it's worth noting. Um, I can only imagine it will only get easier as, as if we have a TTIP agreement. Um, so, but what if, what if the U.S. and EU fail to sign this agreement? What about that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, just about TPA, and TPA is really important for TTIP, but even more so, it's very important for TPP. I don't know if you've heard of TPP, but it's a Trans-Pacific Partnership. I was in New Zealand prior to this, and I worked on the TPP for three years. Um, essentially, it's between, between 12 countries, um, and those 12 countries combined uh, constitute approximately 40% of the world's GDP and a third of global trade. Um, that agreement is very close to being done, and most likely the TPP would be the first up to bat and be passed by uh, Congress and uh, put into effect. But why do I mention this? Well, what happens if we don't have TPP, or if we don't have TTIP, but we have TPP. Where, if those barriers are lowered, and the U.S. increasingly focuses its business efforts on the Pacific, what happens to those trade ties with the Atlantic? It's a question that worries me, um, and that's why I think it's incredibly important that, not, that we not only, not only get TPP, but we also have TTIP to make sure that the U.S. focuses its trade efforts and its relationship relations um, and its efforts on that on both sides, on the Pacific and the Atlantic side. I think that's very important to keep in mind. Um, and I want to say this is a very comprehensive agreement. In fact, this, the TPP is an agreement that I think is going to be, uh, uh, it's going to be a benchmark for future agreements. Again, I think this is one thing that we have to keep in mind. We want to make sure that investors also want to focus on investing in Europe, for example, with uh, safe provisions here, just as they would in the Pacific countries. Um, so second, 
what is it about TTIP that's important? Um, we want to stand, set standards that are driven by values. The United States and EU should be the ones setting the rules of the road, building our commitment, among other things, to strong labor rights and forcible environmental protections and intellectual property rights that encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. So I think that we have the opportunity here with TTIP to show that we can create opportunity without sacrificing standards. This is really important. Um, and by doing so, we compel other countries to emulate what we are doing within the EU, EU, US and the EU. Again, what happens if we don't have an agreement? Well, let me point out that there are economies outside the US and EU are emerging at a much more rapid rate and are growing at a much more rapid rate than the EU, US and the EU. Um, China, for example, is predicted to eclipse the US economy within the next decade. Um, and as these emerging economies grow, such as China, uh, they have increased, increasing market power, and they also have an increasing ability to set the rules of the road uh, when it comes to trade and investment. Um, having served as a diplomat in China for five years, I worked on WTO compliance issues, and um, I saw everything from very flagrant violations of intellectual property rights uh, to the government championing state-owned industries. And to be quite frank, I'm not really quite comfortable with having countries such as China setting the rules of the road when it comes to trade and investment. Again, if the EU and US work together, we can make sure that doesn't happen. Um, again, um, let's see, my computer's stalling out here. Um, last, we want to use our economic partnership to bolster our strategic partnership and promote our shared vision for an open, integrated economies and rule of law. No, TTIP is not akin to a NATO agreement. There's no hidden Article 5 that says we're, uh, the Sweden should come to the rescue of the United States if we're attacked. That's not the point of it. Uh, but history and experience have taught us that, when the world, that the world is safer and more stable when advanced democracies work together. Um, and when we think of hostilities between countries, we often think of conventional military conflict. But in fact, the first measures taken in hostilities between countries are often aimed at each other's economies. And business come up, uh, the businesses and economies are usually the first victims when it comes to hostilities. Um, so what does this mean? Let me give an example of this. Um, last year, the US and the EU implemented economic sanctions against Russia uh, for its aggression in the Ukraine. As a result, Russia retaliated with economic sanctions against a large basket of agriculture products uh, from the U US and EU. Relatively speaking, those sanctions had little effect on Sweden because Sweden does not export a lot of agriculture goods to, to Russia. Uh, but other countries such as Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, they weren't so lucky. Those impacts were very large for them. Um, so let me ask this hypothetical. Now, what if TTIP had been in effect uh, at the time that when Russia imposed those sanctions? Would this have dampened the effects of the sanctions? So economic principles teach us that when you diversify markets, you reduce your risk. And so my guess is that this would have dampened those effects. And I'm not sure where the relationship with Russia is going, but I can only imagine that if we stand up against such hostilities together as trading partners, it's much better than standing alone. Um, so again, I would also point out that we would want to make sure that uh, openness, transparency, and the rule of law are cornerstones of our stability and our economic health and our, princi our principles are universally embraced, and, and what we want to make sure is that other countries emulate those systems. Um, and what I can say is that one person that would be particularly happy if the Trans-Atlantic uh, Partnership failed would be somebody to the east of here, and that's, that's a consideration we should take. Uh, so the choice is ours, but let's make sure that we keep the bigger picture in mind and that we make the right decision. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And now I'll give the floor to Peter. Great. Uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you to the Stockholm Free World Forum for in inviting us to participate in this. This is a obviously very important issue for the American Swedish business community, and it, so this is a great opportunity for AmCham. And, um, and I think I could largely you know, echo uh, much of what uh, Mike said. In fact, I had to readjust some of my uh, comments because uh, Mike made a lot of points I was going to talk about uh, just as sort of a lead in because it's, it's clear that you know, we share the same democratic ideals and have the sh shared aspirations and ambitions on both sides of the Atlantic when it comes to both society and trade. And uh, 
and TTIP gives us the opportunity to move our trade relationship in line with our uh, long-standing political relationship. So I think that just makes sense on, on that level. But I, I've, I've been asked to, to cover primarily the commercial rationale for um, TTIP, and um, I think it's a, it's a fairly clear rationale. Uh, we're already, the EU and the US are already each other's most important markets, and uh, in 2013, trade between Sweden and the United States, just Sweden and the United States alone, uh, supported over 260,000 jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. And an ambitious TTIP agreement could create conditions for further trade and investment, both in the United States and in Sweden, and, and of course, create even more jobs. So I think uh, jobs are a pretty compelling reason to um, in, engage in, in trade and a compelling argument for policymakers. I'm coming from the Hill, I know that, uh, or from Capitol Hill, I know that it's a, it's, it's a compelling argument there. Um, but so what we're, what we're interested in, what AmCham Sweden is interested in, and what the AmChams uh, globally are interested in is uh, uh, an ambitious, comprehensive, and robust agreement that facilitates trade between the US and the EU and benefits society and ultimately creates more jobs and greater value in the market. And um, I guess it, what that comes down to is removing uh, tariffs and more importantly, non-tariff barriers to trade. So there are, tariffs are already low, between uh, the EU and the US, but they uh, remain high for some specific sectors, and they act as a, an unnecessary cost for, for businesses. So if we can get rid of those, I think that would obviously facilitate business. The trickier question is the non-tariff um, barriers to trade. And, um, but I think that there's a, there, there is a, a way forward on that, and TTIP uh, should present us with a, a scenario where uh, we can remove some of these unnecessary barriers where maybe there's a mutual recognition of uh, safety standards for automobile testing, for example, or I mean, it's an endless list and probably not gonna be uh, covered specifically in, in TTIP, not if we wanna get it done in the next 18 months as uh, the US Trade Representative um, Froman has um, suggested he can do now that he has a TPA or fast track authority. Um, the other thing I think that it's important for TTIP to cover is uh, data flow as we move into the uh, more deeply into the 21st century. I mean, data doesn't really know any home, so it's, uh, it doesn't matter if you're doing business transatlantically or not. The the data might be on servers in the United States, even if it's a if it's customers doing business in just in Sweden. So it, um, I think uh, any comprehensive TTIP. Uh, has to have um, language that allows uh, for the free flow of data, the cross-border data transfers, and no requirements for, for forced data localization. Um, some of the other things I think that need to be addressed in TTIP that would be good for business is uh, discrepancies within uh, the public procurement sector. And it's so it's difficult both uh, for EU-based uh, companies to to engage in public procurement in the U.S. And, and, and vice versa. So I think that's um, another thing that our, our uh, businesses throughout Europe are interested in, our member companies, and in the U.S. as well. And um, what else? I think, well, to touch on a, a controversial subject of the investor state uh, dispute settlement mechanism, uh, the only way to have a, a, a TTIP agreement is to have a dispute settlement um, mechanism in it, whether that's um, ISDS, which is I think a bit of a misnomer because people think that it's one system. It's all. It's just a. It's a. It's multiple systems, and, and can the the mechanics of it can differ based on on uh, which arbitral body is rules are governing the dispute. Um, but at some level, there has to be a transparent and clear dispute settlement uh, mechanism within TTIP so that uh, whether you're a Swedish company that's doing business in, in, in Alabama or Delaware, my home state, or uh, a U.S. company doing business in Sweden, you can feel confident that uh, if there's a dispute that uh, you can have a, um, a clear and transparent mechanism to address that, that uh, suit. It doesn't mean that you have to take that route as opposed to going to court, but that that route should be available. And I think that's also important if you look at um, from a more like geopolitical level, like if, if we're gonna be setting the standards, then we should be setting the standards, the EU and the US. And um, 
and if you're, if you're going to have a, a demand and other free trade agreements that they have a dispute settlement rec, uh, system in place, then, then we should have it in, in, in ours as well. Um, and then I think f the final thing I would say, um, yeah, I think the, we're really pleased actually, I think, with the mo movement both w with, uh, s with the EU Commission and w in the, with the U.S. Trade Representative that they're, they're seem, they seem to be taking a really open approach. They're engaging all the stakeholders, and uh, we want to encourage that to, to, to continue because I think that's the best way to dispel a lot of the, the myths and uh, misconceptions and um, distortions and, and, and sometimes just outright misinformation that people who are opposed to uh, trade, any trade, are, are putting out there. It, it, the continued engagement and, and transparency from uh, both sides are are very useful and helpful. I mean, just in the last year, we've been invited to participate in a, in a, a couple of roundtables with the with Dan Mullaney and uh, with Cecilia Malmstrom, and they've really reached out to the to the business community and to the um, the community at, at large to to come up with solutions on on some of the more controversial matters. Excellent. Thanks very much, Peter. So. So let me just ask a quick few follow-up questions before we bring in the audience. So first to you, Mike, you talked about TTIP alongside TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the U.S. is also negotiating and which looks like it's probably going to be finished sometime soon, at least before TTIP is what most people assume is going to be the case. But what do you think are the broader implications for the sort of global trading system as such, assuming TPP and later on TPIP are completed? Is this going to mean that we're going to see more trade liberalization also in other parts of the world? And are we perhaps moving away, do you think, from this sort of multilateral system that we've had, especially with the WTO, which doesn't seem to be making a whole lot of progress with the Doha round being kind of stuck? So is this kind of a new way of doing essentially free trade in the 21st century? And is TTIP really a model here for other regions as well, yeah, do you that's, think? That's a really good question. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, what we've seen in the past decade or so is that WTO has not got anywhere, and I think that's what has been the momentum behind regional trading blocks uh, gathering momentum. Um, and I think, uh, from the U.S. perspective, is that we don't trade or uh, we don't create trade agreements to be exclusive. And what I mean by that is that it's not to be exclusionary. What we want to do is we do believe in a multilateral system. We hope for a multilateral system. But it's about putting uh, building blocks together, and we hope by building a large enough block, such as with the EU, that again it's able to attract others to that model and to follow that model. Again, it's not exclusionary, but again, it's, it's something to build on. Um, Absolutely. And quickly to you, Peter, I mean, are you confident in the sort of political timeline for completing TTIP? I remember when TTIP was launched, both EU and US officials said it's going to be completed in 2015. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. I mean, they might agree on some kind of statement of principles, but we're not going to have a finished agreement anytime soon. So sort of from the business community, are there concerns that TTIP is not on track as fast as it should be? Or are you confident that it will eventually you know, get to where it needs to, needs to go? Um, well, I think I'm confident, and we're confident that it'll, it'll eventually get there. But the timelines, I think, are, are different. I've heard it from EU officials that they hope to have a, a framework in place by the end of this year. And yeah, I think that's pretty ambitious. And, and then uh, just uh, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I think the, the US Trade Representative Michael Froman, in the, in the aftermath of, of the President signing the, uh, the Trade Promotion Authority Act, saying that he hoped to get both the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TTIP agreement, and a couple of other uh, free trade agreements done by the end of the Obama presidency, which is 18 months. Right. And I, Quite ambitious. It seems, yeah. I, and, and, and do you see, as a follow-up, do you see the U.S. elections playing a role there, that these issues are going to be a topic that is being discussed in the elections? We've already seen mm. certain groups on, I guess, both sides of the aisle um, voicing criticism and concern about both TPP, mm. but maybe also eventually TTIP. I mean, is this a concern that if the TTIP negotiations drag out too much, that we'll get into the U.S. election cycle, and then you know, nothing's going to happen until after that election? Yeah, I think that's a legitimate concern, yeah. uh, and it's, it is popping up already with uh, some, uh, some of the Democratic uh, 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 primary candidates uh, voicing opposition to, to, to TPA yeah. and, and to TPP, and 
uh, less so to TTIP, but I think it would only because it's, as Mike pointed out, TPP is going first. And so yep. I think if TTIP was first, they would be getting some more hits, but uh, it's going to get, yeah, more heated. Yep. And, um, but I don't think that will spell the, the end of it. Maybe it makes it harder to get TTIP done before the end of the Obama mm -hmm. presidency. But once there's a, a, a new U.S. Mm -hmm. trade representative in place up in the new, the new mm -hmm. administration, I would see it getting back on track, and then mm -hmm. maybe it gets slowed down again because there's a change in the right. EU commission. EU commission. There's always an election. <laughs> Let's uh, bring in the audience. I want to say that if you want to ask questions in Swedish, that's fine. Ni får gärna ställa frågor på svenska. We'll, we'll translate it. So I think we have a microphone over here, so feel free to jump in on any of the topics that have been discussed or other issues that you want to bring up. Please. And please introduce yourself shortly as well. Thank you. Magnus Nilsson, Frihandelsbloggen. Um, can you see any signs of the Russians or Putin are trying to, to work against TTIP in, in, in Europe? Um, thank you. Okay. Um, do we want to bring up any further questions before we address that? Anyone else at this point? Okay, so, let's, so the issue is about Russia, but also, I guess, more broadly, the sort of anti-TTIP movement, which, especially in Europe, seems to be quite active. I was just walking around here in Visby, and I saw this Trojan horse that said TTIP and politisk Trojan, a, a political Trojan. So it does seem to be the sort of um, anti-TTIP movement, and I think both of you touched on some of the issues that are controversial in the debate, but is there anything else you want to add on the sort of um, anti-TTIP uh, movement in Europe? Um, one thing I would just add, and I think probably one of the biggest indications we've seen, especially with Russia's position on uh, TTIP, um, maybe it's not as obvious to some, but one of the things that we've noticed is that there's a lot of trolls out there, especially attacking TTIP in the media, and uh, these have been traced back to, to Russia. Um, I think that's probably one of the biggest indicators of, um, and again, just in general, I don't see Russia as being uh, happy about seeing a closer cooperation between the EU and the Transatlantic right. Partnership. I think that's pretty self-evident. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add to that beyond saying that there are some, uh, some in some countries in the EU, they talk about, I mean, the ones, the ones that are closer to the Soviet, or the former Soviet Union, countries that were in the former Soviet Union, I've heard them actually refer to TTIP as, economic NATO, so right. um, it, I don't think that's helpful to have that, yeah. that uh, ter terminology, but I, there must be some uh, feeling it, that Putin sees it like that. Yeah. I, I think especially in a European context, the notion of an economic NATO doesn't really fly. I, I mean, I think you clarified that it's, it's not a military alliance, it's a trade agreement that has broader political implications. But I guess one additional area where maybe from a Russian perspective, TTIP is especially worrying is, of course, the impact on energy. Um, obviously, we know that uh, Europe's heavy tr uh, energy dependence on Russia also makes them vulnerable to potential Russian political influence. So to the extent that TTIP can also help open up transatlantic trade with, LN with energy, both in terms of like LNG, uh, but also other types of energy sources, that could be something that could further energy security in Europe, and of course, as a result, be something that um, Vladimir Putin might not view very favorably. Uh, but do you think energy, energy um, is another sort of key ingredient of, of TTIP as well? Uh, from my perspective, uh, yes, absolutely. I can't comment on specifics when it comes to the energy uh, negotiations, part of the um, TTIP negotiations. Uh, but I think it's much broader when it comes to Russia. I may mean, think Russia, as we've seen, its, its stra strategy is really being, has been to try to keep European countries dependent on it for trade, not just with energy, but of other types of trade as well. Again, that's leverage that they lose if um, people can find markets elsewhere and have access to oil and gas right. elsewhere or other means of energy. Right. Absolutely. Any further questions from the audience, please? Um, one here. Microphone here. And then. My name is Katarina. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit about the debate on TTIP in the US. As we see here in Sweden and in other parts of Europe, it's extremely controversial and becoming increasingly so. Uh, how does the US audience react to this? Okay, please. You take the first shot. I mean, this is my own personal perspective on this. Um, but I follow the debate quite close in the U.S. And 
what has taken shape is really kind of in the context of NAFTA. Uh, there's a lot of debate, not about ISDS or about standards. Really, it's more about jobs. Do you want to explain uh, what NAFTA is? What okay, so NAFTA is a North American free trade agreement. It's between Canada, Mexico, uh, and the United States. Um, that's been in effect several years ago. And there's a uh, widespread belief that that actually led to a draining of jobs in the United States. Um, and so oftentimes that's the context which Americans debate it. And so as a result, uh, labor unions in the United States have come out against um, TTIP, uh, which has been very problematic because that's uh, influenced the political debate as well. What about the business sector in the US? Are they fully in favor of TTIP or are there certain business areas that are less enthusiastic or what's the sort of uh, well, among, perspectives there? Among our membership, it's they're fully in support of it, the yeah. American companies in, in Sweden. And I haven't heard of any opposition from, from business back home. But the, the opposition I've heard is, as Mike describes, it's related to, to NAFTA and a fear of losing jobs. And then that gets into democratic politics even. I think there was an article like a, a month ago about a town in, uh, in uh, Illinois that uh, then uh, Senator, or when, when uh, President Obama was running for Senate, he talked about this town's the loss of jobs due to NAFTA. And, and of course, he's in a different position now where he has to create jobs as the president of the United States. And, but this puts Democratic candidates in, in a difficult position, as, as we've seen with the, the, the uh, fast track vote in the House a couple of weeks ago, which was defeated by Democrats. Mm -hmm. At the same time, TTIP is, of course, very different from TPP in that mm -hmm. you would have a free trade agreement with another industrialized you know, part of the world, Europe, whereas TPP deals with a lot of Asian countries where you have lower wages, and you could make the argument that it's more about potentially um, offsourcing American jobs, at least that's what the critics say. But TTIP, it seems like it would be a much harder argument to make that mm. when it comes to Europe. Uh, but I think we have a question in the back, and then any other ones that we want to pick up at this point? Get the microphone to the gentleman in the blue suit. Uh, Michael, you had mentioned the, uh, the Fast Track Authority being signed, the TPA, and the background behind that, it seemed to be a little bit of a uh, political football uh, to begin with, but it really shouldn't have been, given the history of what TPA is. Could you describe a little bit of that? Uh, sure, not to go too deep into U.S. politics, uh, but it plays into what we just discussed here, is that with the fear of uh, Americans losing jobs. It played into the labor unions, which then pushed very hard on the Democrat Party because the labor unions are generally more supportive of the Democrat Party. And so what happened is you had the president's own party generally opposed to TPA. Um, there was a lot of machinations back and forth. It didn't look like it was going to go through because there was a thing called the Trade Adjustment Act, which actually offs helps uh, people that lose jobs in the United States. Um, and it was initially part of an initial package with TPA when it went through Congress. Um, and so the, it was voted through the Senate, but it wasn't voted then through the House of Representatives. Uh, and so then it went as a standalone TPA, uh, which I don't think it was President Obama's um, uh, really what he wanted. But in the end, what he, the President decided that it was worth getting TPA through without the Trade Adjustment Authority. And so, and there's been promises on both sides that they'll try to move through with this Trade Adjustment Authority, but in the end it was uh, Republicans that supported it in, um, in the majority in both the Senate and in the House. Uh, so it was just the irony that it, was the president's, it wasn't the President's own party that helped uh, support getting through through Congress, mm -hmm. in a nutshell. Yeah, I would just add, he, he, signed, he did sign the, uh, the Trade Adjustment um, Author Act Oh, uh, as okay. well as the same time as the TPA was, it was part of the horse trading going back and forth. So right. okay. he signed it on Monday as well. But it is interesting mm -hmm. that you had a Democratic president mostly getting support from Republicans in Congress for the trade agreements. I think that kind of goes to your point about the conversation within the Democratic Party about these kind of trade agreements and how they're sort of, as you mentioned, being viewed very much based on past agreements, which are perhaps very different from TTIP today. Um, so. It goes kind of back to NAFTA again, though, yeah. from an American perspective, because NAFTA was, was signed by then-President uh, George Bush and uh, then had to be implemented by uh, President Clinton, who had opposed it as a candidate. Mm -hmm. So it's once you become president, you actually have to get jobs. You have a, 
you can you, know, you get splintered off from your party if you're a Democrat, anyways, on on free trade. And, and what's your assessment in terms of potential candidates? For instance, Hillary Clinton has she come out in favor of TTIP and TPP? I know that um, on TPP specifically, obviously, when she was Secretary of State, she was very much involved in uh, negotiating TPP, but and 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 pushing the U.S. so-called rebalance to to Asia, but. As a candidate, is she equally much in favor of these trade agreements, or what do you think? Uh, uh, right now, it looks like she's re recalibrating her yeah. positions. But I would, I would add, as Secretary of State, she was very supportive yeah. of TTIP Absolutely. as well. I mean, and in fact, in, in full disclosure here, I mean, I think she was one that also used the term economic NATO. So yeah. uh -huh. I think she might have been guilty of that as well. But um, I, I think she was, and like Peter said, I, there's some recalibration going on, yeah. I suppose. Absolutely. Any further questions from the audience? And feel free to ask questions in Swedish as well. If not, uh, let, me, let me just ask you a couple of very quick last questions. Um, Peter, from sort of a Swedish business perspective, why is TTIP interesting to, to companies in Sweden? What kind of export opportunities would they get with TTIP? Um, you mentioned, for instance, standards when it comes to car safety. Would this significantly impact for instance, the Swedish automobile industry, but are there other examples as well of how Sweden would benefit from this? Um, I would assume that the companies that benefit from TTIP are not only the big multinational companies, but it might also be small and medium-sized companies, so-called SMEs. Um, so maybe if you could touch on, touch on that as well. Yeah, thank you, Eric. That's a good, very good question, actually. I think the, the companies that stand to benefit the most from TTIP, both in Sweden and the United States, are, are, are small, medium-sized enterprises because they make up the, the bulk of the businesses in both, in both countries, in both the EU and the, and the, and the U.S. as well. So I th SMEs would definitely benefit. Whether a, a particular industry would benefit or not, I, I, like the car example, I, I don't know. I, I, it stands to reason that they would if they can cut costs. But I think the, the cost of uh, dual testing for car safety is maybe is obviously more e easily absorbed by a, a big multinational company than a, yeah. than an SME. But there are plenty of examples of of small and medium sized enterprises, uh, Sweden based and the U.S. Um, and U.S. based, that uh, would benefit by the the reduction of non tariff barriers to trade, and we've, we've uh, featured some of them in our video series on, on TTIP, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to be doing some more videos now going forward uh, focused on small businesses, big dreams, and how, and how these businesses here in Sweden and elsewhere in Europe are negatively impacted. They don't go into the U.S. because of whether it's um, uh, burdensome labeling laws or differences in the um, safety, safety specifications for display glass cases. Um, that there are arguably unnecessary differences that, that stop um, the small businesses from exporting their, their product, which stop them from hiring new employees, and which ultimately then also deprive the customers in, in both markets of valuable products that they right. might want. So, so what TTIP would do is not necessarily to say that each side, you, the US and Europe, needs to have the exact same standards, but they would recognize that they're equally good, that an American standard is as good as a European standard. Is that sort of the... I, the rationale, I think. I actually don't know if yeah. that's if they've reached that point. I know that that's been a, an idea, yeah. but I maybe Mike knows more about it. instead of... Um, yeah, just on the standards question, I think it's really important. I mean, it's not so much harmonization, but finding convergence or coherence between the two yeah. sets of regulations is that yeah. what we're looking for. And oftentimes, there's this unrealistic fear that there's going to be a race to bottom, and that's not true. When I mean, you think about most business models, if you look about... I'll take an example from California, where California set some of the strictest emission rules for automobiles in the world. And what happened in the United States when automobile emission standards rose, uh, because companies don't want to produce to two different standards. And so if you have two different standards being produced, companies oftentimes it's, you know, I can't, this is oversimplification, mm -hmm. but they'll rather produce to the higher standard rather than to the lower standard to be able to take advantage of economies of scale. Mm -hmm. It's a simple thing. And, and finally, Mike, to you, uh, we haven't really mentioned the seabird, China. I mean, to what extent is, if the U.S. and the EU are able, through TTIP, to agree on joint standards, what does this mean for sort of rising powers, including China? Will they then, um, will it make it less difficult for them to enforce their own standards, which arguably are much more different from the European standards than the American standards are? Um, so what kind of broader, you know, impact on, on for rising powers would... TTIP agreement have in terms of the standards and the, and the regulations? 
Um, I, I don't see anything except good coming out of it. I mean, really what you have when you have the, ES and U, uh, the EU and the U.S. working together is that you can set standards, not only just setting those standards, but the enforcement and the mm -hmm. expectations that those will be enforced. And when countries don't comply with that, then we can say, okay, well, we don't need to necessarily mm -hmm. trade with you. I only see that only good can come from that and that other countries will step up to the plate and begin enforcing their standards and create better standards. Again, that's going back to the question of being multilateral, and I think that's what we're aiming at. So, so TTIP, in a sense, is a way to reinforce the multilateral system where obviously rising powers given their growing economic size will play a bigger role, Absolutely. but you will still be able to maintain the sort of shared values and norms that the Western countries stand for, and Absolutely. have that be the norm globally. Absolutely. Great. Yep. Excellent. Well, I think we have time for one more question here, please. Right there. Hej, jag heter Gustav, jag kör nog på svenska, mm. du får översätta. Det går jättebra. Ja, eh, det jag undrar lite grann hur det kommer påverka de svenska kollektivavtalen när de behöver konkurrera mot de amerikanska utan svenska kollektivavtal. Kommer inte det på längd försvaga svenska kollektivavtal i Sverige när de konkurrerar på samma villkor? Så so the question is about Swedish um, I guess kollektivavtal, I guess that is the um, yeah, the, the agreements between labor unions and, and businesses. Would, TPAC, would TTIP have an impact on that, do you think, in, in Sweden and in Europe broadly? Um, I, I don't see anything that would harm that in any way, shape, or form. I mean, what we're trying to aim at, especially with labor standards, is that we're looking for the highest possible labor standards there are. We do have different label sta labor standards. We have different approaches to unions. Mm -hmm. I personally wish that we had a little bit more um, uh, cooperation between our labor unions and business in the United more States. Of a Scandinavian model. Yeah, a little yeah. bit more of the Scandinavian model. I'm very impressed with that. But I see nothing that would weaken that ability to make that those agreements, mm -hmm. those uh, collective bargaining agreements. Yeah. And from a business point of view, well, I've heard nothing about lowering any standards, yeah. whether they're labor or um, food standards or safety standards. Or nothing about lowering standards. It's about, yeah, as Mike said, finding some coherence mm -hmm. and, um, and and potentially um, when you open up the markets, then maybe the the collective the collective bargaining agreement here in in Sweden would have a positive influence on collective bargaining in the U.S. and and exposing uh, the labor cooperation through the historic cooperation that's existed here since like the Salter Baden Accords or maybe before um, could serve as a positive model in the U.S. But I I, I know of no part of TTIP that is aimed at lowering any standards. Right. It's about lowering tariffs and non-tariff uh, barriers to trade and facilitating trade, but no one wants uh, any race to the bottom. Excellent. Any last questions from the audience? I think we're going to have to wrap up. Um, I want to thank both our panelists for a terrific discussion, which I think um, led us beyond some of the sort of current hot issues to talk a little bit more about the big picture, why TTIP matters for Sweden and for Europe and, and for the West in a changing world. So please join me, give me a big hand to Mike and Peter. Thanks. Och innan vi avslutar jag passar på att göra reklam för ett till eh, seminarium här om TTIP. Eh, handelsavtalen mellan EU och USA, hot och möjligheter. Det är nu 13.45 på Sankt Hansgatan. Så det finns eh, broschyrer här framme att hämta upp. Tack så mycket. <applåder>